It is good to be back in the Lord's house this evening, and good to see each of you. Uh, it is a wonderful blessing and honor to be here with the folks here at the Farrells Creek Church of Christ, and it's just always a blessing to be with the Lord's people. Uh, this evening, we're going to look at a scripture in Acts chapter 6. And talked about the church last night, and uh, uh, well, talked about who is Jesus, and he's the greatest person that ever lived. And with Jesus being the greatest person that ever lived, he's got, he had the greatest institution that's ever been established, and that's the church. And Jesus, he's valuable. And if he's valuable, the church is valuable. The church is his body. And this evening we're going to look at, although the church is valuable and it's precious and it was bought with the blood of Jesus, sometimes that there's problems in the church. You know that, I know that, and there's problems that come into the church. And I, I truly believe that Satan, we've got an enemy. He was the enemy of Jesus Christ, the enemy of God. And he targets you and I. First Peter chapter 5 and verse 8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary the devil, he's as a roaring lion, and he, he walketh to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. We've got an enemy. And I truly believe that our enemy, he doesn't want to be outside of the body of Christ and try to hurt us. He wants to get right in the middle of where the people of God come together and try to tear down what we're trying to build up. So there's problems that face the church at times. In Acts chapter 6, there was a problem in the church. And we're going to read about that this evening. But um, before we do so, let's go to God in prayer. Father, I thank you for this evening. Thank you, Father, for your wonderful grace and love and mercy. And Father, you're just so gracious to us. And Father, your love, it is unconditional. Father, we would be nothing without you. And Father, anything that we are and everything that we are, it's because of you and your wonderful love in sending Jesus to die for us. Amen. And Father, we have hope of eternal life because of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Why, in the waters of baptism, we put on Christ. And we're a new creature in Christ. Father, I pray that you will just use me this evening. And Father, I know I can't do anything on my own accord, but Father, as I trust in your word, your word, it's the gospel, it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And I pray this evening, whether anyone ever leaves here this evening or maybe a, a month or two down the road, I pray, Father, if they don't even remember my name, that's okay as long as they go away from this meeting, learning about who Jesus is. Amen. Father, and what I mean by that is help me to get myself out of the way and let Christ be shown through what I say here this evening. And Father, help us to lift up Jesus in the church. And, help, and Father, the scripture says, if Jesus be lifted up, he shall draw all men unto him. So that's our prayer and that's our, my plea this evening, that people will, will be able to see Christ through what I have to say, or through the scriptures this evening. Father, I pray that if there's anyone here this evening that's lost and undone, on their way to hell, Father, I pray that they'll make that decision this evening to obey the gospel. Forgive me, Father, in the ways that I've sinned against you. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Amen. This evening, the title of my message, although we're looking at Acts chapter 6, we're going to look at the first seven verses there. And we're looking at a problem facing the church. But I put a title to this message, Realize You Are a Servant. And I wonder if, and I truly believe this, that the greatest title that you could ever wear this evening, of course, 
The greatest name that we would have is Christian, but the greatest title that someone would ever look at you and a description they could place upon you is to be a servant of Jesus Christ. And I truly believe that the problems that come into the church, they could be, they, they could be resolved if we would understand we are merely a servant of Jesus Christ. He's got the answer to every problem. If we would just see ourselves that we are his servant, he is our Lord, he is our master, we belong to him, and we would see ourselves for what we truly are. And we would just be at his beckoning calling and be his servant to do his will. Amen. I want to take you on a little journey leading up to Acts chapter 6, and you can turn along with me, but I want you to see how the church started out. The church started out in Acts chapter 2, and as I said, it was the greatest institution that has ever been established. We read last night that not even the gates of hell shall prevail against the church. Amen. In Acts chapter 2, as Peter was preaching, look how the church started out. Peter told them what they needed to do. Those folks that, were, that had sinned, they had crucified Jesus. He told them in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. On that day, that was the, first, the, the, the opening of the church. How did the church start? Started in a glorious way. Acts chapter 2 and verse 41, the Bible says, they, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. On the very first day, 3,000 people were added to the church. They listened to the preaching of the word of God. Why people didn't get upset at the preaching of the gospel, or, or maybe some did, but here what we see is there was 3,000 that gladly received the word of God. If there's those that rejected it, it's not recorded. But what a glorious start that 3,000 were added to that church. But then in Acts chapter 2 and verse 47, we see that the church it didn't stop growing. The Bible says, praising God and having favor with all the people. Acts 2 verse 47, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Wouldn't that be wonderful today that every day the church was going about as servants and telling people about Jesus and they were obeying the gospel. They were gladly receiving the word of God and listening to the word of God and receiving it gladly and obeying it. And as they did, the, the Lord would add to the church even today, daily such as should be saved. Wouldn't that be a wonderful sight even here at Farrell's Creek Church of Christ that on a daily basis people were obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ? Amen. And any other congregation that's here this evening, that would be wonderful. The growth of the church. But it doesn't stop there. You turn over to Acts chapter 4 and verse 4. The church that continued to grow. The Bible says in Acts 4 and verse 4, how be it many of them which heard the word believed. Many people that heard the word believed. And, and the number of the men was about 5,000. You turn on down to Acts chapter 4 and verse 32. No longer does it say that the church or the, 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 the Christian people there, those that believe, no longer does it use the word thousand, but how does it describe them in Acts chapter 4? And verse 32, and the multitude of them that believed of, uh, were of one heart and of one soul. And then it says, neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And what I'm showing here, the church, it was just continuously growing. And then we get over to, of course, we know in Acts chapter 5 there was even a problem, but we'll not look at that this evening. And then in Acts chapter 6, we're faced with a problem. But even when you begin reading in Acts chapter 6 and verse 1, notice how it describes the disciples. And in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied. Did you notice in Acts chapter 2, when it started out, there was the church, that people were added into the church. Now they're being multiplied to the church. 
while there was continuous growth in the church. People were seeing themselves as servants and they were taking their relationship with God seriously and they were working for God. Amen. But there was a problem. And let's read the rest of this. Acts chapter 6 verse 1 through 7. And in those days when a number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring, complaining. I don't know about you, but I hate even the very thought of negativity. Why, complaining and being negative, it does nothing but destroys positive thinking and, and a positive influence in the body of Christ. But there was a problem here, and it needed to be dealt with. But there was murmuring here of the Grecians against the Hebrews, and here's the problem, because their widows were neglected in a daily ministration. What does that mean? These widows, they were being neglected about their daily living. These were widows that they, they got their support from the church, apparently. They needed food. They needed ways of daily living or, or needed to make sure that their living on a daily basis was being taken care of. And that was being overlooked. Then the twelve called, that is the apostles, they called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Now I'll say more about this in a moment, but the apostles, they didn't say this is something that is, you know, minimal. They didn't see this as something that was small, something that didn't need to be dealt with, but they simply said, we cannot leave the word of God and do this. This is not our uh, responsibility. It's yours. <clears throat> so the apostles, they didn't see that it was unnecessary. They didn't see that, uh, that, that it didn't need to be dealt with. It was a serious problem. But, it, but here's what they said. The disciples, uh, the, the, the 12 called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, it is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. But here's the solution. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men, full of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose uh, Stephen, a man full of, the, full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip and Prochorus and Nicanor and Timon and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Now let's stop reading right there, and once again, let's look at this problem. This was a true problem in the church. Why the, Gre the Grecians, they murmured, Against the Hebrews, you had the Gentiles and the Jews there in this congregation, the Greeks and the Jews. And, and, and the Greeks, their widows were being neglected, so they went and they started to murmur about this. Our widows need to be taken care of. That's a problem. They may have not been a, a problem. And I truly believe this. Maybe if people really saw themselves as a servant of God, we need to take care of each other. Maybe if that, that was the case, there wouldn't have been a problem to have been addressed. But the widows were being neglected. And notice again, the apostles, they were simply saying, this is important, but it's not our work. Why well, we can't neglect the ministry of the word to wait on tables to make sure these widows are being taken care of. But there is a solution. The apostles, they had a work. And here was their solution to it. You choose seven men. And give the qualifications here that they needed to look at in these men. And I truly believe, it doesn't mention that these men were deacons, but I truly believe this would be the first time that deacons were addressed and set aside for this work. A deacon is to care for the physical needs of the church. So they set aside, they chose seven men, and those seven men, they were to serve the physical needs of the church. I suggest to you the church today, that maybe, just like it was in this church, maybe things are being neglected. Now, 
maybe just as they were then, and I don't know anything about here the Farrell's Creek Church of Christ, but maybe in the congregation that uh, Blackie and maybe at Farrell's Creek, we can look within this congregation and see there's some things that we really need to step up to the plate about. There's some things that we need to give more attention to. There's some things that's been neglected. And right now, we need to we need to really look at our life and we really need to look and see, am I really being a servant of God that I need to be? Now, maybe things are being neglected, not only in the congregation, but maybe things are being neglected in your life that you know you should be doing. And I want you to see, every time, and I've, I've got a few people here in mind, but every time throughout the scriptures that you see there was a problem, God had someone that was a servant that he stepped up that he used. He had some people that would step up and, and I'll give you some examples. And in the book of Mark chapter 15 and verse 21, people were used to resolve problems and we know that God, he's the one that is able to take a problem and, and, and to fix that and he gives us a solution for it, but he uses people he uses godly people that will step up. And, and today, the, it's, it's like the poem, the only hands that Christ has today is our hands. The only feet that he has to, to spread his word and to go to people is, is your feet and my feet. The only mouth that he has to tell people the glorious news of the gospel is my mouth and your mouth. So he uses people as servants, and he always has. In Mark chapter 15 and verse 21, Jesus, he was being, he had been arrested. He was going to be crucified. He was, uh, a robe was put up on his bloody back. A crown of thorns put up on his bloody uh, scalp. And he was going to be led up a hill to where he would be crucified between the heaven and the earth. And can you imagine as Jesus, he'd been whipped with a whip of the cat and nine tails. Could you imagine as our Lord was beaten and mocked how weak his body must have been? And maybe as they were traveling, just maybe that physical body was so weak that he needed some support. He needed some help. He needed someone to step up and that was willing to help. The scripture says in Mark chapter 15 and verse 21 that they compelled a man out of the crowd that was passing by to, to step up and to help serve on that day, even to help carry the cross of Jesus. And his name was Simon of Cyrene. Simon of Cyrene helped to bear the very cross of Jesus. There was another man that came to my mind where there was a great problem in the world. And God said, I've got a servant. I've got someone in mind that even in the midst of all of the turmoil and the sin and the strife and, and even during this time, every imagination in the heart of man was nothing but wickedness. But you remember there was a man during the very time, the very beginning, that he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. It's even said that this man walked with God. His name was Noah. And when there was a problem, God used Noah to step up and to build an ark. And you can read about it in Genesis chapter 6. When, he was gonna, when it was going to rain for 40 days and 40 nights, God told Noah, I want you to build an ark. Here's the dimensions of the ark. I want a window put in that ark. I want a door put on that ark. And he told him exactly how to do it. He told him exactly the dimensions. And it was built to God's specifications, but he used Noah to solve a problem because Noah found grace in the eyes of God. But you know what else Noah did while he was doing that? 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5 tells us that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. Can you imagine that during this time, and it was about 120 years before the flood came, Noah out there beginning to build that ark and he's preaching to people. There's going to come a flood. It's going to rain. Get ready. The rain is coming. 
And can you imagine people saying Noah's crazy? We've never even heard of rain. Up to that point, there was a mist that came up from the ground and watered the whole face of the ground. And they might have thought Noah's crazy, but Noah, he just continued to build the ark, continued to preach, and one day, water began to fall from the sky and rain began to come. And that, it began to rain and it never stopped. And I imagine on that day, God used Noah to solve a problem. Could you imagine those people that didn't believe in Noah, didn't believe his word, or didn't believe the preaching that he had, the things that he had preached? Could you imagine as that water began to lift that boat, that box, that ark up, that people began to, I'm sure they began to beat on the side of that ark and began to scream out, we believe you, Noah, we believe what you were preaching to us. Open up. Open the door unto us. But he couldn't. You see, there was a door there. But Noah wasn't the one that shut the door. It was God. Amen. Just like the church. There's a door to the church. It's Jesus Christ. Right. And we go in through, into the church through Jesus Christ. And one day the door of the church is going to be shut. And when it is shut, that's when Christ comes. And we stand before him. And when the door of the church is shut, it'll never be open again. And time has run out. Well, whenever that problem of sin had taken over the world in Genesis chapter 6, God truly used Noah. And he saved him, his wife, and his three sons, and their wives, Sham, Ham, and Japheth, and their three wives. But for everyone else, it was too late. I want to tell you, Nathan, Daniel, can you imagine Daniel? And I love this story about Daniel in chapter 6. And we're not turning over there. We, we're, these are stories that we're familiar with. But Daniel, he was taken to, the, to, to Babylon. And you know, in this pagan land, Daniel, he still had his faith in God. Amen. It never wavered. Right. He even gained favor with the king, Darius. And other men, they got jealous, I'm sure. And they went and they said, we need to get rid of this Daniel. So they went and had the king sign a decree that if there was a petition asked of any other god except for Darius, any other person or other, any other authority or king or God except for Darius, that they would be thrown into this lion's den. Any petition, you know what that was? That was Daniel's prayer life. And you know what Daniel did? He knew about this decree, but you know what he did? He went in his home where he was at, and three times a day, the scripture tells us this, three times a day, he did exactly what he had done before that decree was made, he bowed down upon his knees in front of that window facing Jerusalem and, and, and facing, facing out just like he had before and he prayed to his God. Where did this wind him up at? In, in that lion's den. There was a problem. He was faced, he was put in that lion's den. But even in the very storms of life, God will be there with us. He'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. And Daniel knew that about his God. Amen. And Daniel, while he's there, Darius began thinking about this. And he went over. And I'll play this out in my mind. He went over. Because he really cared about Daniel. But he had made that decree. He had to stick to it. He spoke Daniel's name. And to his surprise, Daniel spoke back. And she said, Why well, I'm still here. O oh, king, live forever. God, he came and he closed the mouths of the lions. I'm still here. Amen. He ordered for Daniel to come out. And the scripture tells us that what happened from that point is that those men that made that decree that they were thrown into the lion's den with their families. 
And he made another decree. And that was for them to honor God. What a blessing. One other, and I'll share it with you. Whenever there's a problem, God has people that will stand up for him. It will be his servants. That they'll not cower back, they'll not shrink back, but they'll stand up, they'll realize you are the Lord, I belong to you, I am your servant, I belong to you, I'm bound to do your will. Amen. You know that's what it means that we're a servant. The, the word it means a bond servant or slave that we belong to Jesus Christ. And we need to see ourselves that way. Whenever we leave out of the church house on Sunday, Sunday morning or Sunday evening or whenever we meet together and throughout the week, we need to realize no matter what temptation comes upon me this week or no matter what struggle, I belong to Jesus. When it comes time for us to assemble together, we have no problem with that because we belong to him. We're bound to do his will. But there was another, and I like this, Moses. You know, Moses tried to make excuses. We try to do that sometimes. There was a problem. There had been a problem in Egypt for 430 years. The people of God was enslaved by Pharaoh and the Egyptians. That whenever there's a problem, God has an answer. <laughs> Moses. He's out near a bush one day. And that bush is burning, but it doesn't burn up. And God speaks to him. And as he comes to that bush, God gives him command. Take off your shoes for you're on holy ground. And I want to tell you, when we walk with God, we need to remember every day that we live, we're on holy ground. Amen. Whenever we become a Christian, he give us his indwelling gift of his Holy Spirit. That means that every day that I live, the beauty of the church is righteousness, and we are on holy ground when we're walking with God. And we need to live that way. We can't be a Christian, we can't straddle the fence and be a Christian and live any way we want to in this world. Right. We're a servant of God. But, it, but God told Moses, I've got a work for you, Moses. I'm going to send you before Pharaoh. And you know what he said? Who am I that Pharaoh's going to listen to me? Well, he said, who shall I send? Or who shall I tell it sent? And I love this answer. Tell them the I am has sent you. Amen. When we go out at night and we look up into the sky, into the sky, we can understand if we'll think about it what that means that the I am has sent you. The one that would hang a moon at the moon at night so that we can have a light to guide us. The one that will Hang these stars for us to look at. The one that gives us this bottle of sun during the day and that blesses us. The one that completely takes care of us every day that we live. Amen. And we just think, what does it mean, the I am? It means that he is the self-existent one. He doesn't need you and I to exist, but we need him every day that we live. That's what it means that the I am has sent you. He's the self-existent one. He, he exists all by himself. People ask, where did God come from? We don't need to be concerned about that. God has always been. He doesn't rely upon someone else to exist. He is God. Amen. Tell them I am has sent you. And then he used the excuse. I can't speak properly, and I don't know what that means. Maybe Moses was saying, I've got a speech impediment. But you know, God said, I'll take care of that. You've got a brother that's three years older than you named Aaron. He'll be your mouthpiece. Right. And I'm telling you, whenever we realize I'm a servant of God, no matter what excuse we come up with, God will take care of those excuses. 
But there was a problem. He, God took care of the problem. Those Israelites were in bondage. And he sent plagues upon Pharaoh and, and the Egyptians and he protected the Israelites. The last plague was, of course, the death of every firstborn in Egypt. And Pharaoh finally said, enough, enough, Moses, I'll let you go. And Moses, and the Israelites are traveling. And notice the problem here. They're traveling to their safety. And they've got the Red Sea in front of them. There's nowhere to go. The Red Sea is in front of them, and who is behind them? Pharaoh, 600, I believe it was 600 of his chosen chariots behind him, and, and Pharaoh, and they're coming after them. Death is be before them. Death is behind them. There's no possible solution here except one, and that is God. Amen. Moses said in Exodus 14, Stand still and see the salvation of God. And he caused that Red Sea to part and they went through on dry land and he took care of the problem. And no matter what problem we ever face, God will take care of it. Amen. We could look at all stories and what we see is the people and the servants of God. They had work to do. And you've got a work to do. I've got a work to do in the church. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 58, the Bible says, My beloved brethren, be ye steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain. In Luke chapter 9, verse 23 and 24, I want to read that to you as well. Luke chapter 9, verse 23 and 24, the scripture there says this, and he said to them all, Jesus speaking, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up, take up his cross daily and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. Realize you're a servant. You've got a cross to bear for Jesus. Right. Now don't, don't just look at the need in your life or the congregation. You know, if we look at a need that we have in our life, something that we have neglected, and there's a problem that we need to fix in our spiritual walk with God, and we see that, but we don't do anything about it, well, there's no need to even look at it. If we see an, an area within a congregation that we, that we attend, and, and we don't step up and try to be the man or even the woman or, or the person that God would have us to be to use our talent for God, we're just wasting our time. Right. I am afraid too many believers have settled for a specta spectator attitude toward Christianity. They come, sit through a service. They listen to another person teach or preach. Other people sing, someone else pray. Then they go home and changed by those events. Christianity is not something we can do from the sidelines. It's not a spectator sport. The church in Acts chapter 6, they saw this. The apostle said that this is an important job that needs to be done. But you need to take care of it. The church needs to be involved. This, the seven that was selected, they realized this. Will you realize it? We must be, become involved in carrying the cross of Jesus. Look at this community Look at this congregation. Look at yourself. What are you neglecting for the Lord? What are you negle neglecting for His church? What are you neglecting for yourself? What are you neglecting in service to Him that you need to change? Maybe it's prayer. You know the Bible says to pray without ceasing. I, I, heard, a, I heard a story one time about some preachers that had come together and they discussed that very scripture in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 17. Pray without ceasing. With all the work that we have to do, how can we just pray all the time? 
And they've discussed that and discussed it and discussed it. What does this mean? We've, we, we've, got, we've got other things. We preach, we teach, we're visiting people, we're talking to people, we're, we're, we're doing other things. How can we always be in a state of prayer? There was a lady there, not, not one of the preachers, of course, but a lady that cleaned the church building. She just overheard what they were talking about. And she kind of smirked or kind of giggled at their conversation. One of the preachers said, Mary, do you know what this scripture means? She said, of course. You mean to tell me with your life, everything you've got going on, you can pray all the time? Certainly. Do tell, Mary, how do you do that? So she began in the morning, and after God has blessed me with a night of sleep, I wake up with him on my mind. I thank him for a good night's rest. I ask him to look over me during the day. As I sit down to eat my breakfast, I can't help but to thank him again for the food that he's blessed me with. As I travel to my work and I arrive to where I'm going to work, why I can't help but to thank him for the job that I have that provides means of support for me and my family. And then all during the day as I think about my family and my friends, I, I, I can't help but to thank him for the blessings of my family and my friends that he's blessed me with. People that's sick that just come into my mind, I'm always praying and then at night, I thank him for the day that I've had, ask him to forgive me in any way that I've fallen short during that day. With this, the preacher that asked her to explain just said, thank you, Mary, for reminding us to always be in a state of prayer. Maybe you neglect prayer in your life. We need to pray without ceasing, always be in a state of prayer. Maybe you neglect daily Bible reading and Bible study. We should be students of God's word. 2 Timothy 2 verse 15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Maybe you neglect to visit the sick and the shut in, or the widows, or, or evangelism to the lost, or faithfulness to the assembly, whatever it may be. See that need and do something about it. I want to get ready to close here, but I'm reminded also of a little story. That the church building, the local church building had caught on fire and the members of the church just ran out to the church and, and they began to get buckets of water and water hoses and, and, and things of that nature and started throwing water on the church. One of the church members looked over and saw this man and he was doing the same thing, putting water on the church building. The church member said, I've never seen you here before. I pause because what he said was sad. The man that replied, he replied, I've never seen the church on fire before. Doesn't that give us something to think about? The church in Acts 6, they had a problem. They had a need. Brothers and sisters, this congregation, I'm sure you've got a need as well. I'm telling you people, right where you live are on their way out of this world without the knowledge of Jesus Christ, without obeying his precious word, without Christ, they have no hope. I read to you or quoted to you last night, but I, I, one of my favorite scriptures, John 14, verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. There's the need. People are dying without Christ and going to hell. That's the need. Amen. How is the problem resolved? Let's ask Jesus. What's the answer to this, Jesus? Mark 16, verse 15 and 16. Go ye therefore, preach the gospel to to every creature. Go and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. 
Amen. Who does he use to solve the problem? You and me. Amen. Are you a Christian? Realize he is your Lord. You are his servant. Get off the sideline. Study, read, pray, evangelize, serve him, serve him, and serve him. We'll stand and sing her invitation hymn. If you see an area that you're neglecting in your life, let's resolve it this evening. If Jesus is, is not your Lord at this point, make him your Lord. Surrender your life to him. The way that you do that is by obeying him. Have faith in him. Repent of your sins. Make a mouth confession that you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And be baptized in water for the forgiveness of your sins and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Stand as we sing, and if you have a need, you come at this time. Just as